Hi. This is a PlayStation 5. This is the DualSense controller. This is an Xbox Series X, and just slightly off camera, this is a Nintendo Switch. It took me nearly four months after it launched to acquire one due to the massive supply strain. Of course, the PlayStation 5 isn't the only product struggling to be easy to attain for the general consumer. I was fortunate enough to get an Xbox Series X pre-order in before launch at my local GameStop. I live-streamed it. But it too is impossible to get easily. Even the cheaper Series S as well. PC gamers aren't left out of this issue either, with the latest 3000 series NVIDIA GPUs, 6000 series AMD GPUs, and 5000 series Ryzen CPUs all virtually impossible to get. Even older 2000 series and 1000 series GPUs are becoming increasingly harder to get at fair prices, as we face the largest silicon shortage we have yet experienced in our lifetime. Some of this is due to factory shutdowns due to COVID in 2019 and 2020, but the rest is simply due to an increase in demand that was not foreseen, with everyone in the world staying home way more often than usual, increasing demand for in-home entertainment, something video games provide in spades. Switch wasn't immune to this either, despite being a newer technology. It saw sellouts and shortages for several months last year. It saw sellouts and shortages for several months last year, though these days it's actually much easier to find a brand new one if you really want one. Scalping switches is no longer a profitable venture this year. Someday it won't be for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series as well, as, you know, all those latest PC gaming parts. I spent three months with my Xbox Series X playing it several days a week. My background in gaming, as the name of my channel suggests, is largely Nintendo. I have practically zero experience with PlayStation, and I never owned a PlayStation 4. While I have dabbled in Xbox in the past, it was to get the third-party games Switch and Nintendo didn't get and play the occasional Halo game. I grew up in the traditional console war sense that, hey, if you own a Nintendo, screw Sony, right? This attitude has melted away as I aged, but I felt satisfied enough with Switch, PC, and Xbox to never really feel the need to dive into the PlayStation ecosystem. So what compelled me then to even try so hard to get a PlayStation 5? Curiosity. I spent a majority of my gaming life missing out on the entire avenue of gaming that I have never experienced before with PlayStation. How can I truly call myself a gamer if I haven't given a fair shot to everything at one point in my life? So now that I own a PlayStation 5 for the first time in my life, I have all of the current gen gaming devices in one house. Switch, Xbox, Series X, PlayStation 5, and yes, even a gaming PC. The gaming collection is complete. I even have the latest iPhone. There is virtually not a single game that can come out on any platform from phones to PlayStation 5s to massive gaming PCs today that I'm unable to play. For the first time in my life, the entire world of gaming is open to me. This is exciting. It's invigorating. It's also expensive. Especially $70 games on PlayStation 5. Ouch. But this isn't about what it's like to be an all-system gamer. This is actually about a Nintendo fan's take on his first ever experience with PlayStation through Sony's best offering, the PlayStation 5. I even got the console with the disc version to boot, making sure I am not missing a single possible feature in my first experience really diving into a Sony platform. The experience buying a PlayStation 5 is, as you probably can guess, a shit show. You're competing not only with millions of other consumers on a single digit stock drop, you are dealing with thousands of scalpers using bots, aka computer programs, to get an advantage on the everyday consumer and swipe up all the stock, selling them on secondhand markets for premium pricing. Even when you do get a PlayStation 5 into your cart, there's no guarantee you're actually about to buy one. The systems are not available in store, creating chaos buying online. I was fortunate to get mine at my local Target, buying it online after hitting checkout over 472 times on two different devices. It took me over 42 minutes to complete. This was my 19th attempt to get a PlayStation 5 on a stock drop since launch. I've had similar experiences at other stock drops, only to fail to ever check out.
Not true this time. It magically went through. So I picked up my PlayStation 5, and here we are today. My initial impressions of the system are... <laughs> it's quite large. It dwarfs the Series X in a surprising way. My unit also came with a manufacturing defect. Uh, I also have had an issue on the bottom of my system. Do you see this hole here? That hole is not supposed to be there. There is a manufacturing mistake with my system. That hole is where you're supposed to screw in the stand. I cannot screw the stand into my system uh, because that hole is filled in by plastic that was supposed to be cut out at manufacturing. So that means that this system did not get properly tested because they're trying to get everything out the door. Needless to say, the quality testing on these units is likely taking a hit as they try to catch up to demand. Corners appear to be getting cut, but who cares what the system looks like or the fact that it has some fundamental flaws in design? What's it actually like to play? In fact, what did I play? Well, I have no experience with PlayStation's offerings, so I felt a good place to start is with the included pack-in experience Astro's Playroom. It is the software that shows off all the new features of the DualSense controller, the first controller from Sony that feels comfortable in my hand. While I still prefer offset sticks, this feels usable to me without the threat of cramping my hands, like prior DualShock controllers did. Astro's Playroom is brilliant. It's a really good platformer to boot, but it also shows off how brilliantly this controller is designed and why it's actually called DualSense. It has the unique ability to take advantage of your senses to create an immersive experience. The Rumble, my gosh, that Rumble's next gen. Switch has advanced, advanced Rumble as well in HD Rumble, but DualSense takes that enhancement and makes it look like child's play. This Rumble is just different. And unfortunately, when talking about the controller, you really do have to try it for yourself to understand why. The combination of on-screen action, extra sounds coming from the controller's built-in speaker, which is surprisingly a decent quality, the resistance on the triggers, and the true rumble that can somehow make you feel the difference between running on sand, glass, and metal is truly astounding. In fact, it felt Nintendo-like. One of those controllers you hold that you feel like only Nintendo can deliver. But instead, it's Sony. I can only imagine how much increased immersion is going to exist when their next-gen VR releases in 2022 with this controller in hand for those that prefer to play VR that way. Of course, like many things, I'm aware DualSense controllers suffer from drift and the adaptive triggers can break as it's reliant on a plastic spindle gear. Neither the control sticks or this plastic gear are really built to last, which is unfortunate given how great the controller feels. It's really the first major enhancement in controller design, in my opinion, since Wii. But for while it is working, which mine's working fine right now, it is truly something else. Same can be said for the console design. Gamers Nexus already did all the testing, but PlayStation 5's air intake is completely choked off, and the way the air flows is completely inefficient, with fin stacks that point in different directions. In fact, the cooling is so poor, it seems to be the reason we cannot expand storage right now. An update is coming this summer that will let us finally use that expandable drive slot, but they are ramping up the fan speed to do it. A band-aid for poor cooling design. For general consumers, liquid metal typically has a two-year maximum effectiveness before it needs to be cleaned and reapplied. At first, the thought was maybe they used it, despite this, to just squeeze that extra bit of cooling out of system to keep the fan silent. Reality is, when you replace the liquid metal with really high-quality, made-to-last 10 years thermal paste, the system overheats. In Astro's Playroom, let alone other software, it crashes. This is a huge sign that the cooling design of the system is flawed to a massive degree. And one way or another, in around three years' time from purchase, a lot of PS5s are going to be having a problem or two. Of course, Sony will just expect you to buy the new and improved Slim at that point, or maybe even a Pro model if they decide to bring out one that fast. Still, the technology inside the system, like the Series X, is still fairly cutting edge. Some people will be fine accepting that they will need to replace the system in three years. I'll be interested to see where my system stands in 2024, and if I experience issues that are expected to occur either from the controller or console's poor design. That being said, General consumers, they just want the game. I don't want to limit myself to just the packing game as well, as that's typically always going to put the system's best foot forward. It's great that Astro's Playroom feels revolutionary, but do these controller innovations translate into real uses in games? After all, HD Rumble felt amazing in 1-2 Switch. 
but very few games use it. So I went ahead and bought Sackboy, anticipating using their guides feature advertised before launch. Uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales and the Deluxe Edition at that, so I could play the remastered PlayStation 4 Spider-Man game, uh, because I'm a big Spidey fan, and I never played either of them. I also purchased Demon's Souls, less because I plan to play a lot of it, more because of, as of right now, it's the only exclusive game on PlayStation 5, so it's like one difference I can have in talking about PlayStation 5 versus the Xbox Series X. Thus, I feel like this best measures what PlayStation 5 has to date, and that game wasn't held back by PlayStation 4, so that's something to be said. And, well, the games are pretty amazing. Is that a surprise? Sony has a reputation of publishing top-tier games, and these three titles do not disappoint. The thing is, you can play all but Demon Souls on PlayStation 4, and I'm not really into Demon Souls itself. So while the game looks and plays great, it's just not for me. Also, I have to admit, most of the controller innovations didn't really matter to me when I played these games. Sure, there was some resistance in the triggers. Sure, there was some interesting stuff done with the rumble. But in the end, none of it felt as good as Astro's Playroom. So to me, I almost feel like a lot of the DualSense features are a bit of fool's gold in that lots of promise, but for the most part, most people aren't going to use it. Now, I know some people seem to say that they enjoy the adaptive triggers in games like Call of Duty. So maybe that's a, a thing that I should have tried out. But just to be honest... Uh, Astro's Playroom is amazing, and it's probably the best we're ever going to see the controller get used. See, I can't even really speak for how much better PlayStation 4 games play on this system because I never played PlayStation 4 counterparts. So I'll say this. I have a 4K TV. It's only 60 hertz, so I can't take advantage of the 120 FPS options on the few games that have it. And I don't have HDR10, although it does have some form of HDR. It's just not the kind that's compatible with the system. So I don't have that perfect synergy that others might have with their TVs. I have more of what I feel like is the general consumer mindset. This is just the TV I got, and I'm not going to go out of my way to spend a lot of money trying to get the perfect TV to pair with the system. I played Miles Morales with ray tracing on at 30 FPS. Frankly, since I had never played the game before, it felt wonderful. It looked gorgeous, but it does on PlayStation 4 too. Ray tracing is a neat feature of this system, but just like when I can see it on PC, it never really jumps off the screen to me as necessary. More like a nicety I can do without, as lighting engines has, have already gotten really good on their own. Still, I played with the prettiest mode in that game because, hey, you know what? I'm cool with a lock 30 FPS. I'm a Switch gamer after all. Uh, the other games ran as I expected, but then I've been playing max settings higher than 60 FPS, 140-40 hertz monitor over here, hello, on my PC forever. I'm not nearly as bothered by 30, 60, 120, or more FPS as others, as I no longer play games competitively. As a casual consumer, all of them are fine so long as they are close to locked. It's the dips that really get me, more so than the top end frame rate. That being said, I obviously know 60 FPS is better than 30, 120 is better than 60, and so on, and I enjoy that benefit on my PC. But it's never ruined my experience playing games on Switch, so it's not going to ruin my experience if I play at 30 or 60 or 120 on PlayStation 5. Frankly, keep the frame rate stable, and I'm happy. So yes, I love playing games on my PlayStation 5. However, if I owned a PlayStation 4... I'm not sure I would go through the hassle of getting a PlayStation 5 for what? Better frame rate and resolution and load times? Those are all important things, but you get the same thing when you upgrade your PC. And people don't always feel compelled to upgrade their PC all the time if what they have already can play what they're playing. The reason I got one is specifically because I don't have a PlayStation 4. If I still had my Xbox One X, I wouldn't have gotten the Series X either. I posted a hot take on Twitter where I don't feel like either of these systems are things people should be clawing their way through all the bullshit to purchase right now. Not just due to the lack of exclusives, which both platforms have a massive lack of, more so than any prior generation to be honest. Uh, both have half-baked or sometimes outright missing features, design flaws, and frankly, I can get even better looks and performance on PC. However, I am unique in that I have the option when most don't. So, should you buy a PlayStation 5? I think that depends. If you're like me and never dove in the Sony stuff and have a huge interest in doing so, you might as well. Though I wouldn't rush and fight through people to do it. Alright guys, here's the PlayStation 5 controller. Now tell me, 
You guys have played PlayStation 5, right? Yeah. Yeah, we played it today. Okay. What do you guys think? Is it cool? Awesome. It's, it's awesome? amazing. It's amazing? What do you think, Oliver? Awesome. What do you think about it? What do you like so much about it? Yeah, I know you guys the, got to play the... Astro's Playroom. What do you like? I usually like that, like, Asteroids Playtime game. Playroom, because yeah. Because this controller makes them move, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, is a there anything special see? about the controller you like? Yeah, this I, side. You like this the touchpad? Touchpad? Yeah. The touchpad? Okay. Um, I like uh, the sound effects oh, that come through there. Oh, because it has a speaker, there. yeah? Yeah. What about the rumble? You like that? Do you yeah. The rumble? Um, I didn't really feel the rumble. Oh, I didn't that's either. Now, question. You guys are children. Do you like this better than Nintendo? Yes! Yes! No. That's my boy! Boo. Why do you just give the high five to all of What am I doing to my children? PlayStation 4s are also very hard to get right now. So if you really don't have one already, you might as well own, you know, the best of the best and just hold out and save your money and nab a PlayStation 5 hopefully by holiday of this year, if it's ever easy to get this year. If you currently own a PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 4 Pro, I think you should at least wait until they are easier to attain and that there are a few exclusives you care about. Of course, when I gave this hot take, people quickly told me, hey, going from Xbox One to Series X, PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5, felt great because all these old games are at 4K and 60 FPS. So your mileage will vary, but frankly, there is more to a game than what resolution and frame rate it runs. And having watched and experienced games on Xbox at, at least and seen other people play PlayStation 4, I don't feel the performance on those platforms is to be so god-awful in most cases to make the games un unenjoyable. Certainly not so much that it's worth the hassle and the dedication it takes to currently get these systems fighting through millions of other consumers. I am a gaming YouTuber. I am a tech enthusiast. I like shiny new things. I'm happy I have them. I'm fortunate to have them. But I am not so sure I can suggest any of my friends fight for either system right now if they have the old ones. That being said, I'm having fun and I'm looking forward to everything Sony has to offer for as long as my PS5 lasts anyways. The biggest thing that stands out to me about the PlayStation 5 is this controller, the Dual Sense controller. Uh, it has amazing rumble. You guys remember HD rumble and the big deal Nintendo made out of it? And you could really experience that well with like a game like 1-2 Switch. Well, this is beyond that. This is next-gen rumble if i've ever felt it and i feel like there's just so much going on with this controller that makes it maybe the best controller in the marketplace for some reasons it's still to me not the most comfortable controller to hold i still prefer holding a switch pro controller or an xbox series x controller and i still prefer my sticks you know kind of spread apart but there's a lot to be said about this controller that Sony got right. One, it's more ergonomic for me, so it does feel better in my hand than the old DualShock controllers. But beyond that, the combination of the amazing rumble effects, the ing speaker that adds a lot of volume to it, and obviously the adaptive triggers or whatever these are called, haptic feedback triggers, whatever they call them, feels amazing. And you get this right off the gate with what, in my opinion, is the best demo pack in game of all time in Astro's Playroom. Legitimately, Astro's Playroom is just a fantastic game that just happens to be a demo for this controller. And my lord, is it awesome. Now, I'm not going to review Astro's Playroom here. There's a lot of references in there to, to a whole bunch of different uh, games that have been on Sony platforms over the years from uh, Last of Us and... Uh, I, I don't even know because I didn't really even play them. But Crash Bandicoot, I know there's a reference in there. References to a whole bunch of different games. What's really cool, though, is that this controller feels great. It has just this premium feel to it that's different than Xbox and different than the Pro Controller for Switch. And it's the kind of controller innovation that I'm surprised to see Sony do. This is something I expect Nintendo to do. I like having all platforms, and this is the first generation where I truly have all three platforms. But the thing is, on the Xbox Series X, I'm mostly just playing Madden right now. I could have played that on the Xbox One and been perfectly happy. On the PlayStation 5, while obviously uh, I've been enjoying Astro's Playroom, I could have done without that experience. The primary game I've been playing on this thing is Sackboy, and Sackboy came out on PlayStation 4, and for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much just as good. Now, there's some cool features with the PlayStation 5 where obviously you get your 4K 60 FPS, and I do play this on a 4K TV. 
don't have HDR. Sorry, I'm not Richie Rich over here despite all this in front of me. I can't just have the best of the best of everything. Nothing about this system is built to last, and I highly suggest you wait until there's a revision. I know it feels weird saying that because I'm going to be enjoying games on this bad boy and talking about games in the future, but honestly... Um, we're going to need a revision for this, I think, before I can suggest to buy it, at least in its current state, because there isn't a lot of games to play. When you go to the, the network part of it and you go to PlayStation 5 games, it's just a bunch of PS4 games plus Demon Souls. Like, there isn't a real compelling reason to buy this beyond just wanting to have the latest and greatest. Same's true of the Xbox Series X, by the way. I love this system. It is far more baked and far more ready to launch than the PlayStation 5, but it also has a games issue. Let me be clear here. There is a games issue with next gen across the board. At a time that Switch is getting killer game after killer game after killer game, I mean, the first big game for this doesn't come out till the end of April. The first game people care about doesn't come out until June. The first game people care about on Xbox is Halo Infinite, and we have no idea when that's coming. There's the promise of greatness here. The promise of performance here. The promise of amazing next-gen experiences you can't get anywhere else. But for right now, everything you can get on these systems, except for Demon Souls, you can get elsewhere. And Demon Souls is just a remake. It's not even a new game. It's a fantastic remake, but it's not new. So it's hard for me to suggest you go out of your way to buy this. Because the buying experience to get either one of these systems right now is a pain. I got mine from Target. I was at checkout. This is my... 10th time trying to get it from Target during one of their drops, and it took over 400 times trying to check out before I actually made my process go through. It is very difficult to buy systems that, for the most part, you guys aren't going to be able to play much on. Now, it's cool that you could bring your old library over and you're trying to future-proof yourself, but why worry about that now? Why not wait until there's more exclusive games for these platforms, which, by the way, are probably not going to have much exclusive content for the next couple of years. So I think it's best to wait. Now, if you can't wait, okay, fine. Good luck. Uh, I'll link you to uh, this guy named Jake Randall who helped me uh, procure this PlayStation 5 and is trying to help me procure another one for a giveaway I did last month. And the Xbox Series X, I actually procured all on my own. I actually had it pre-ordered before launch. So I don't know. My my long story short is the controller is am 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 amazing, although... There's been reports of problems that I haven't experienced yet. The overall design of this system um, is flawed when it comes to cooling. All the features don't work right now, and there isn't really any compelling games. Um, you might say, Miles Morales, go play it on PlayStation 4. It's pretty much just as good. And I'm not here to compare PlayStation 4 to this platform because I can't. This is just coming from the perspective of someone who's primarily played Nintendo. I'm going to be playing the hell out of this, just like I do on my Xbox, because I don't have an Xbox One or PlayStation 4. But if I did, I wouldn't even need to boot these platforms up. I mean, 4K is cool, but is it that cool? After all, don't we buy these systems for the games, not the specs? Maybe that's just my perspective as a Nintendo gamer. As you saw, my kids clearly really enjoy the controller a lot, but hmm, there's no Mario. There's no Mario Kart. There's no Super Smash Bros. You know, upcoming, we have new Pokemon games coming. We have Splatoon 3. We know there's games coming for these platforms, but I, I wait until the games are here before making a purchasing decision. That's my ta hot take for someone who actually kind of likes this platform. If only there was a reason to own it besides the fact that I just didn't have a PlayStation 4, so I figured, why the hell not? All right, folks, I'm Nintendo RoboJets from Nintendo Prime. Thank you so much for tuning in. You know we'll be streaming games on all three of these platforms over on the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash Nintendo Prime TV. Be sure to enter, by the way, our giveaway, whatever that giveaway is right now at the time that this thing comes out. I don't know if it's still the $99 Nintendo Switch eShop gift card or if there's something else, some games. I don't know. Be sure to check the pinned comment for that, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.